Welcome to our sixth Cosmos Rewind Google Hangout, sponsored by Celestron. Go out and get yourself a Celestron telescope. They're great telescopes. In which the editors of Astronomy and Discover magazines will dissect each episode of Cosmos, a space-time odyssey, which I'm sure you're watching and enjoying. This past week's episode was titled Deeper, Deeper, Deeper Still, and it explored the cosmos on microscopic, atomic, and subatomic scales. To give us, let, let me first introduce our distinguished panel, which is changing a bit week to week. Some familiar faces are back this week, though. We have Bill Andrews, Associate Editor of Discover, with us once again. Bill, great to have you. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. As always. Lisa Raffensperger, Associate Editor of Discover. Lisa, how, how, how's everything going today? Great. I'm excited to talk about tardigrades. Excellent. Rich Talcott, Senior Editor of Astronomy. Great to have you back, Rich. How are you doing? Thank you. Pretty well. Tired after the eclipse last night, but otherwise <laughs> okay. That's a good reason to be tired, though. Yep. And I'm Dave Eicher, editor of Astronomy, and I am pleased to be with you once again as well. And I'm tired, not because of the eclipse, but because I just got back from New York and spent about six hours at Newark Airport yesterday. But that's another story. But before we get going on our Hangout today, I'm going to throw things over to Dr. Talcott to give us an episode summary from the latest from Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. Rich, take it away. Thanks, Dave. In episode six, Neil explores the hidden dimensions of the cosmos, ranging from the subatomic and microscopic levels all the way to the birth of the universe. He begins by exploring the cosmos contained in a dewdrop. We board the ship of the imagination to penetrate inside a water droplet, where we see Paramecia roaming about in the tardigrades we first met back in episode two. Although these creatures are smaller than the head of a pin, the ship must dive even deeper to take us inside a piece of moss, where we see photosynthesis at work. The process is performed by chlorophyll molecules, which absorb sunlight and use its energy to convert water from the soil and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into chemical energy, producing complex carbohydrates and releasing molecular oxygen as a byproduct. Photosynthesis is arguably the most critical key to life on Earth, and it also could play a role on other worlds, a topic we explore in the June issue of Astronomy. Neil then turns his attention to flowers. After a brief sidebar discussing how Charles Darwin correctly predicted that a long-tongued insect must live on Madagascar to pollinate a particular orchid, he delves into the science of smells and memories. It turns out that scent molecules all have specific shapes that stimulate receptors in the nose, an electrical signal that goes to the olfactory nerve in the brain, which happens to lie near the parts that control emotions and stores memories. That's why the smell of a lilac on a June day can tr trigger such vivid recall. Next, Neil takes us back to two early Greek scientists, Thales and Democritus. Thales was the first to articulate the notion that the order we see in the world does not derive from divine or mystical forces, but rather can be deduced from natural causes. Democritus first discussed this atomic theory, that all matter consisted of tiny particles so small that they could not be divided. The word atom itself means indivisible. Neil then gets into the way atoms can come together to form crystals, each of which has a unique atomic structure that repeats over and over. He then highlights carbon as a special atom because it can bond with many other atoms to create molecules far more complex than any crystal. That's why carbon is the backbone for life on Earth. After a commercial segue, we see a young boy carrying a bouquet of flowers to a girl. As he touches her cheek, Neil explains that in a very real sense, the two are not touching at all because the electrons in the atoms of the two kids repel one another. Atoms consist mostly of empty space with a massive nucleus in the center and a cloud of tiny electrons surrounding it. We then see Neil in a cathedral, where he makes a nice analogy that if an atom were cathedral sized, the nucleus would be the size of a dust mote. Although electrons may not touch in our world, Neil takes us back to the ship of the imagination to dive deep into the sun's interior. Here we see hydrogen atoms moving so fast that they overcome their electrical propulsion and fuse. Hydrogen gets converted into helium through this nuclear fusion, creating the energy that powers the sun and other normal stars. The temperature at the sun's center reaches about 15 million degrees, which Neil correctly says is not hot enough to fuse helium. However, the sun's core will grow hotter in a few billion years, when helium will be able to fuse into heavier elements. Although Neil later says that the energy created in the sun's core takes about 10 million years to reach the surface, the true number is closer to hundreds of thousands of years. 
Another particle created in the sun's interior is the neutrino. And Neil goes into considerable detail describing this ubiquitous but elusive particle. Physicist Wolfgang Pauli first theorized these particles as a way to balance the law of the conservation of energy, which seemed to be violated in certain types of nuclear reactions. We see Neil in a small raft inside the gigantic underground Super Cameo Kandi neutrino, neutrino detector in Japan. Nothing against Neil's personal hygiene, but this was a computer-generated effect. The water in the detective is so pure that scientists wouldn't allow someone to contaminate it by sticking his or her hand in. Neil then talks about the neutrinos ejected from supernova 1987A, which occurred 27 years ago in our neighboring galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Super Cameo Conde detected several neutrinos from that explosion, which helped astronomers understand how massive stars explode. The episode wraps up with Neil discussing how neutrinos could be a probe of the first seconds following the Big Bang. The microwave radiation we see as the cosmic background radiation comes from a time 380,000 years after the Big Bang. But because neutrinos hardly ever interact with matter, they would have escaped from the primordial fireball within a second or two. If astronomers ever detect enough of these particles, it would open an entirely new window on the universe's birth. Back to you, Dave. You know, thank you, Rich, very much. That was a great summary. You know, Rich, Bill, and Lisa, I really liked this episode. I thought it it wandered and, and explored a number of related things, but it did so in a really cohesive and powerful way, uh, a little bit more tightly than the last week or two, and really brought everything together in the end uh, and explored atoms and molecules and subatomic particles uh, in a tight way with regard to objects in the universe and also living systems. And that really made you uh, appreciate and understand the relationships uh, between matter on different scales in the universe and, and with, with beings in the universe. So I was really, really pleased with this episode. There also weren't any sort of, you know, there wasn't a moment that made you wince here either this week. It was confident. It was really well scripted. It was well portrayed, and we didn't have any sort of, you know, there might be universe inside a black hole moments where you, you, you know, fell out of your chair for a moment here. Th this was a really, really finely tuned and brilliantly acted episode, I thought, that I was very, very pleased with. Well, what did you guys think? I thought... I mean, yeah, the, the guiding organization of this episode was really kind of the continued shrinkage of scale, which was a really nice um, kind of touchstone to return to, whereas in other episodes we felt a little scattered. We, we weren't totally sure what the linkage was between... We were jumping between light and enlightenment, and that hung on this metaphor that was maybe not the best framework for an episode. But in this case... It was really nice to have sort of packaged together the the cellular level down to the atomic level down to the subatomic level, um, and I mean that's a a way of assembling knowledge from all these different domains that that sad to say I feel like we don't often get in the, in like a basic science education, and so it was relatively late in my science learning into sort of high school before I really put together um, sort of atoms and molecules in the way that that, that interacts with the cellular level and, and the mechanics that kind of drive both of those as, as one thing. Um, whereas in this episode, we absolutely saw that right off the bat, that we're kind of down at the tardigrade level and then we're even smaller inside of a cell and then what is a cell but but mechanical <laughs> in this in this envisioning it's a factory a very cartoonish factory but you know but nonetheless we see that it is at its basis a mechanical assemblage of molecules so i i really liked it and i mean we 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 did we went all the way down and then at the very end we went back cosmic which was which was a nice way to finish I want to just agree too. I'll just step in and say that I think I think we all seem to enjoy this episode. Last week there was a little more uh, contention, and I think last week the issue was that it was scattered and and it didn't really work for some of us. But this week I was really impressed that it was still. I mean, it was in a way scattered. It talked about everything, biology and neuro stuff and 
space stuff and physics and chemistry and cosmology and just evolution. Everything pretty much came up in this episode. And but it made sense this time. That underlying framework of going deeper and examining further and seeing what the next step was and how that kind of underlaid everything. It was underlying everything. Made it make sense. And I really appreciated that this week, especially like we said last week, things are a little more kind of jumbled up. And the other thing that I thought was was kind of fun this week was um, when it was talking about the historical folks, Democritus and Thales, and I mentioned that this show hasn't been shy about being kind of confrontational a little bit. It was a much more, the confrontation this week was just a more casual, like, yeah, no, check it out, it's great. This is how the world is, but it's awesome. You know, not not kind of a fighting stance, but just kind of a, come on in, the water's fine. And, and how nice that is, too. And the truth of that underlying, you know, principle of, going deeper still, figuring out what the next step is. Nothing is ever good enough for scientists. We understand something pretty well, but can we understand it better? Is there something, you know, okay, atoms, let's say that's the, the deepest step, but can you go deeper than that? What's inside an atom? And being able to keep that kind of curiosity and getting that uh, momentum going for figuring out the next step of the scientific kind of frontier, I thought, I thought it all worked really well this week, and it was kind of just... Hang on, enjoy the ride. This is science. Check it out. I thought I thought it was a lot of fun. Well, you all know that I like to be a rabble rouser, but in this case, I have to agree with everyone else that it was a good episode. As an editor and occasional writer, one of the things that I always enjoy is people that can tie things together and make nice segues in between various points. And I think Neil did a really good job of that last night, two nights ago, when he... Um, tied all these disparate elements together from the very small to the size of the universe and the um, beginning of the universe and tied it together in a way where you never really thought, how did he get from here to there? It seemed seamless, which was really nice. And as a person who, one of the first articles I worked on at the magazine was all about Supernova 1987A, I really enjoyed him going to Super Cameo Condi in the neutrino detector and talking about that and the neutrinos that came from it, which really was a watershed moment in our understanding of how stars explode. Well, well let me ask you about that, Rich, because you're, you're an expert on Supernova 1987A, and for those who may not know as much as, as you do, or God help us, may not have even been around uh, in 1987. Now, tell us a little bit, why was that such a big deal, Supernova 1987A, and what did it really tell us about the universe? That was a huge, huge event uh, of the 1980s uh, that, that, that was important uh, in a lot of ways for astrophysics, wasn't it? Oh, definitely. Uh, 87A was really interesting for several reasons. One, it was the first nearby naked eye supernova since the invention of the telescope about 400 years ago. And so it was the first time astronomers with modern equipment could take a close-up look at something that was bright enough to see with the naked eye, at least if you lived in the southern hemisphere. So it was something that could be studied in great detail with modern instruments, which really opened up a large, large range of options. It was the first supernova that was close enough to detect neutrinos from it, and that was something that theory told us should exist. We should be able to see neutrinos. They should be formed in the collapsing core of a massive star. And the fact that we actually discovered a dozen or two of these elusive particles coming at the exact time of the explosion um, really cemented that theory that it was what was going on. Another interesting thing is because it was in a neighboring galaxy and not in our own, we had a clear line of sight toward it. Uh, we haven't seen a supernova in the Milky Way, as I said, in well over 400 years now. But the thing is, is that if we did have a supernova in our galaxy, it would likely be blocked by lots of dust in the plane of our galaxy, and we'd have a difficult time getting clear views of it. But the Large Magellanic Cloud sits well away from where the Milky Way's dust and gas exist, and so astronomers could look at it, granted across 170,000 light years, but they were able to get a clear look at it with the modern equipment. So it really did uh, change our knowledge of these things. 
Well, that's great. And tell us a little bit about the Super K detector, if you will, as well. We know that was a CGI sequence that was not uh, Neil in a rowboat, but what, what is that detector doing and what are other neutrino detectors, Ice Cube, the old uh, <clears throat> defunct uh, home state gold mine in Leeds, South Dakota, what are these neutrino detectors doing and how do they work and why do you need so much water in there? And uh, and how big a deal is that for particle physics, these detections that, that they've had in recent times? Well, as Neil mentioned, uh, neutrinos are extraordinarily elusive. There's several million of them passing through your body as we speak right now, and yet only very rarely does one interact with regular matter. The reason they don't interact is because, one, they have a very small mass, much smaller than even that of an electron, and they have no electrical charge. And because of that, they hardly ever interact with matter as things that have charge do. Um, they're very elusive. You need lots and lots of something that's very pure in order to capture one of these things occasionally. You typically need to bury them deep underground because the reactions that they have in the water or the cleaning fluid that was the case in the Homestead gold mine in South Dakota, um, these things uh, Particles from cosmic rays and other things up above coming down can also create the same kind of flashes that Neil showed in the uh, episode the other night. Uh, the flashes basically happen because the particles that uh, the neutrino interacts with are moving faster than the speed of light in the medium, and I should probably mention a little bit about that. We all think the speed of light is the maximum speed possible, and that's true if you're talking about the speed of light in a vacuum, but as soon as of the photon enters another medium like water, it slows down considerably um, to about um, 30, by about 33% in the case of water. And the neutrino is passing, is passing through at almost the speed of light, so it's faster than the light would travel through there. Uh, this set creates a reaction in the water that basically creates light, and you see a cone of light coming from the reactions. So that's what these things are looking for. They were originally, interestingly enough, set up for a different reason. Um, the one in South Dakota at the Homestead Gold Mine was set up to discover neutrinos coming from the sun um, because our theories of how stars shine depends on how many neutrinos are coming out. And for a long time, nobody, people did not see as many neutrinos coming from it as they expected. Uh, it turns out it was because these particles actually do have a very small mass. And originally, uh, scientists thought that they had no mass. If they had no mass, we should have seen about three times as many neutrinos as we did. But because they have mass, there are actually three kinds of neutrinos, and only the, the detector could only detect one of those. So that's why the number was about a third of what they came up with. The other reason that they built these neutrino detectors early on was to try to detect the, dec the decay of the proton, which is a fundamental particle. Um, Particle physics tell us that the proton should decay with a long lifespan, um, many times the age of the universe, but as with radioactive decay, um, if you put enough of these particles or enough of these protons together, you should occasionally see one decay. And so the idea was to determine whether the ideas of particle physics were correct on that score. Um, more recently, we've been looking at neutrinos as a way of, for instance, observing uh, the sun in more detail than we were able to before to learn about particle physics because the neutrino is an important uh, piece of that puzzle as to how all matter is put together and also to take a look for what uh, Neil talked about at the end the cosmic micro or the cosmic neutrino background which are neutrinos that emanated from the very beginning of the universe and the hope is that one day we'll be able to detect these in enough numbers to be able to learn something about those first few seconds Outstanding. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about neutrinos because I think we have a question coming in and we had one that came in earlier. In the part about neutrinos, uh, Neil said that when some radioactive elements decay, they eject an electron becoming a new element. Would that make it an ion of the same element? I, I thought number of protons determined what element an atom ha uh, was. Well, that's a good point, and it was something that I came across, too, when uh, he talked about it. I think it was just a little bit of a glossing over what's actually going on. The Wolfgang Pauli, who's the one that uh, first theorized the neutrino, was talking about something called beta decay, which is essentially the release of an electron coming from a 
nucleus during a radioactive decay. But the beta decay is actually a case where a neutron turns into a proton in the nucleus of an atom. And when it does so, it releases an electron to keep the charge of the atom the same. So the element does change um, by one, it becomes one smaller in terms of its atomic number, and an electron is released. And it was the fact that the electron didn't have as much energy as the conservation of energy would lead us to believe that Pauli suggested that there was a separate particle that came out, which was the neutrino. So Wolfgang came out all right in the end. Yep, and that's one of the reasons he got the Nobel Prize, although not, <laughs> not the main one, so <laughs> he was a pretty good guy. Now we have a neutrino question from Twitter, from Twitter too, from Indigo Crush. Why can't we feel neutrinos as they pass through us? if so many of these things are passing right through our bodies? Well, it's kind of like if you ever have an x-ray in a doctor's office, for instance. Uh, you don't really feel the x-rays going in. Um, most of them are passing through your body and only highlighting the dense parts of it, like bones. Um, neutrinos hardly ever interact with matter. One, they have such little mass that the gravity does not affect it. Um, obviously, gravity wouldn't have much effect on the scale of a human being anyway. But the key thing is that they have no charge, and almost all the interactions we see in our local area of the universe come about because the electrons, um, the charged particles and the atoms, are interacting with one another. And because neutrinos don't have any charge, they can basically zip through without feeling any effect. Very good. Well, let's go to our resident uh, biologist, Lisa. Uh, tell us about people just can't get enough of tardigrades, can they? <laughs> this is the second time in Cosmos the tardigrade has become a major star, and people just love them out on the Internet there. Tell us a little bit, and, and Bill as well, what, what are these things? What the heck are they? Why are they so fascinating to everyone? And, and how can they be such super survivors? for a half a billion years on, on planet Earth. Yeah. Um, it's true. The Internet loves them. The producers of Cosmos apparently love them. And uh, to be fair, the Internet did love them, I think, even pre-Cosmos. So maybe that's what they were picking up on. Um, so um, they're actually... Uh, I was not totally clear on what sort of class of... of of critter they are, but they are animals, tardigrades are, um, and uh, I don't, we had gotten a reader question about how many are on our bodies, and I don't think we know the answer to that, but I did find there are, there, they did a survey in sort of an urban environment of, um, of Argentina, so probably applicable to a lot of the kinds of places that we inhabit, the bus stations and sidewalks and things, um, and found that there were 10 to 50 tardigrades per cubic centimeter on these kind of everyday surfaces. So you can think, you know, probably just about any outdoor area you are, that there are, you know, unseen millions of tardigrades everywhere. Um, I, I had heard from a tardigrade researcher at one point that Probably on every bite of salad you take, there are you know hundreds of tardigrades. So, um, so, so right you know, now, because of the rat burger, do you know the rate of of people taking showers every day is skyrocketing <laughs> in the United States? That wouldn't help them though. The tardigrades <laughs> hang out in the water too. There's no escape. That's true. Mm. Um, yeah, and Billy, you did research on more of their biology, I think, and compliment to that. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I was, because I hung out on the internet before Cosmos 2, so I was aware of tardigrades, also called water bears, also called moss piglets. Sounds like they're just making it up after a certain point, but apparently those are legitimate names, so we should coin one right now. We can come up with some other name if we want. Um, I also, I, uh... While I, while I talk, I can share. I think I, I have a couple of tardigrades here. I call this one tardigrade in the wild. That's a nice kind of uh, uh, candid shot of a tardigrade just hanging out, just doing his thing. Um, they're really weird. Not just their faces, which obviously they don't really have faces. They just kind of come out and eat according to the cosmos. But they can be, like Neil Tyson said, ridiculously hardy creatures. They can live 
at pressures that, you know, under deep, deep underwater at super strong pressures. Um, they could live in outer space. I mean, they could survive out in the vacuum of space, which almost nothing else really can say that. They can uh, survive right by incredibly hot uh, thermal vents, and the heat doesn't really bother them. They can, they're can they extremophiles, and they can live and thrive in these crazy, ridiculous, extreme environments. Also, as we have just recently been made aware, they can survive pretty much anywhere else, hanging out on your in your backyard, on your salad, perhaps in your mouth right now. Who's to say? Um, and the other thing that I thought that was neat about tardigrades, let me switch pictures here, a nice a nice uh, face shot there, as it were, um, is that, uh, where, where am I, where am I? The other, the other interesting and crazy thing about them is that they can, not only can they survive in these crazy environments, they can go... They can basically go into cryogenic or cryonic sleep. If if they get dehydrated, and you know if you go out into space or if you get if you're in a parched environment like a desert, water is hard to come by. So if these creatures get really dehydrated, they can survive for decades. They can easily go at least ten years without food or water, and then you sprinkle some water on them and they come back and they're fine. And that's weird, right? Already, and Apparently, the, the record for them is, like, 120 years. And they know that because at a museum they had some moss samples that were 120 years old that have been kept in storage, dry, you know, no moisture. So these tardigrades were able to kind of shut themselves down, cool out, get dehydrated, and then 120 years later when researchers investigated these things, they poured the water back on them and they came back to life. It's crazy. It's like nothing to them. I mean, a lot of those particular ones happen to die shortly after that because they were still very old. But, I mean, the fact that they can go all that time just just hanging out, not doing anything, that's really incredible. That's, I mean, and as Neil Tyson also said, they're one of the oldest animals here on our planet, uh, surviving all kinds of extinction events in addition to just everyday hazards. I'm going to end with the last one here. The tardigrade is not to be messed with, people. That's some horrible-looking stuff that they have at their disposal. And even though they're really tiny, my research found that the long, the biggest ones can be one and a half millimeters long. So conceivably, you could even look at them. I mean, theoretically, they'd be really, really tiny. You need good eyesight. But it's not like these are microscopic, completely invisible creatures. These are just very, very small. They're everywhere, and... One more cool fact about Cosmos is that, hey, check out the tardigrade. It's everywhere, and it's amazing, and it can do stuff you can only dream about. Nature's awesome. And you can't get rid of them. Not, not even those Clorox uh, cleaning uh, wipes will get rid of these things either. Mm, huh? I wouldn't think so. so. You can, a lot of people are not going to sleep all that well tonight. <laughs> Wait, nope. did someone do an experiment with Clorox wipes? Do we know this for scientific fact? Well, i got to imagine if it can survive in space. <laughs>